In this video, I'm going to discuss an episode in Iranian history a little discussed outside of Iran, known as the White Revolution, an initiative set forth by the last Shah. If you're unfamiliar with the recent history of Iran, I'd point you to a previous video of mine called The History and Politics of Modern Iran, a Primer. Aspects of this video will make more sense to you if you know everything I explain there. But back to the White Revolution, which is a textbook case of the road to hell being paved with good intentions. The situation in Iran in the 1950s was that around 150 families controlled more than half of the arable land. One landowner held an area the size of Switzerland. A dozen landlords controlled between 40 and 50 villages each. The Shah wanted to break this old power structure, which had persisted in one form or another for over 2,500 years, and to give the land to the peasantry. In this, he was opposed by the clergy, also known as the mullahs, the feudal landlords, the wealthy aristocracy, and the remnants of Mossadegh's old national front. Incidentally, the Shah's reforms came to be known as the White Revolution because he intended it to be bloodless and to counter any possible Red Revolution from Mossadegh's old supporters and communist groups and to counter what he called a black revolution from the clergy. After a decade of talking about such measures, in 1961, the Shah overrode all objections with an executive order on the 11th of November. He declared, The interests of the nation override all other considerations. If we concern ourselves with impractical regulations and lose the favourable opportunity available to us now, we shall commit a great sin. The progress and development of the nation should be given priority over adherence to impractical laws and personal tests. With utmost speed, the government should intensify its drive against corruption and uproot it in the shortest possible time. No obstacle should stand in the way of the government's translating this program into practice. I am confident that the intelligent and honourable people of Iran will cooperate sincerely with the government in carrying out this program and thus will add to the historic honours of the nation. A six-point plan, which was later expanded to 19 points, was introduced in January 1963 after a referendum gave the Shah's proposals a majority of over 99%, with only 4,115 votes of over 5.6 million cast. Against. The six points were, number one, land reforms to, quote, abolish feudalism. Number two, nationalization of forests and pasture lands. Number three, privatization of government-owned enterprises and industry. Number four, profit sharing, giving employees a 20% share of profits. Number five, expansion of the voting franchise to women. And number six, formation of literacy call to educate the population, 66% of whom could not read or write. On the passing of the bill, the Shah claimed that this was one of the most significant events in 3,000 years of Iranian history. He said, My dear nation, from now on we together shall turn the pages of history. With God's help we shall build a most progressive and vigorous country. The shackles of slavery and bondage are broken forever. In these efforts, he was strongly supported by the Americans and personally by JFK. Indeed, Lyndon B. Johnson had met with the Shah when he was the vice president in 1962. And the Shah aped LBJ's rhetoric. But instead of talking about the great society, he talked instead about the great civilization. Naturally, the Shah's intentions were not totally benign. He also had political hopes attached to these reforms. First, he hoped that the peasantry would be grateful to him for freeing them from the shackles of feudalism and releasing them from ruthless and exploitative landlords, and therefore they would support him as new patriotic citizens. Second, that the old aristocratic power base would be broken, and third, to appease the newly educated professional middle class who were travelling abroad and watching Western television. 
The new professional middle class should not be underestimated. 17,000 students attended university every year within Iran and around 15,000 were being educated abroad. Around 40,000 Iranians were travelling for business and pleasure. There were over 1 million radio sets and over 67,000 TV sets reaching an audience of around 670,000 people. The university educated people who had experienced Western modernity or who had seen it in the media were starting to ask questions of the Shah's regime and wondering why such freedoms were not enjoyed in Iran. So some aspect of what the Shah was doing can be seen as a kind of virtue signal to appeal directly to this class of people by helping the poor unwashed peasants. However, the measures did not resonate with many of the peasants themselves, since the Shah had used Western phrases such as feudal, which meant absolutely nothing to them. Concepts that seemed virtuous to metropolitan elites were completely alien to a peasantry who could not read nor write. Another issue was tribal nomadism. Unlike in Europe, where the peasantry had been fixed to specific locations, in Iran, due to its geographic features, fixed agricultural settlements were not the norm, and a significant portion of the population were both tribal and nomadic. One of the driving forces behind the land reforms was a man called Hassan Arsanjani, who openly was contemptuous of the old nomadic ways of life. He decried them as a vestige of the Dark Ages. He wanted to end this medieval practice of migration and living in tents, which is useful for little except the opportunity it gave foreigners to take photographs of them. He wanted the nomadic tribes to settle in agricultural areas and become farmers. He said the Iranian peasant, who although wholly illiterate, could recite his national epic by heart, was filled with resources of intelligence and character which had been untapped for centuries. The lamp and the bulb were there, only the liberation of a just social order was needed to supply the necessary connection and the electric current to light them. Every aspect of Persian life and initiative began in the village. The only real source of a potential resurrection of Iran was the Persian peasant. However, the clergy objected to the land reforms on three counts. First, they argued that existing conditions were not feudal. Second, they said that these measures do not constitute progress, but rather social and economic dislocation. Third, they said it is illegal under Islamic law. On the claims of feudalism, the clergy argued that the high estimation of Arsanjani and others of the peasantry is misplaced. There's no need to romanticise these people, they argued. Second, that radical change to these socio-economic patterns that have endured for centuries could harm agriculture and lead to mass migration to the cities. Third, they said that the peasants could not be transformed into patriots as the Shah hoped. As Sultan Sultani, a major landowner, put it, they were waiting for the camel's tail to reach the ground, which is a Persian expression meaning roughly when pigs will fly. The most outspoken critic of the White Revolution was Ayatollah Khomeini, who made a famous speech against it in June 1963. More on that in a moment. The Shah, meanwhile, launched a counter-charm offensive targeting the 75% of the Iranian population who were peasants. It was a battle for their hearts and mind with the clergy. He said, The next generations will live in an environment which I hope will be equal and comparable to the highest social standards anywhere on the planet. Thus, on this road, the free men and free women of Iran must head towards the future. Your income should be such that you and your family are full that you will have smart clothes, that you will have a nice house. 
Unfortunately for him, these arguments mostly fell on deaf ears. The Shah's appeals to universal and rational norms were seen as inextricably Western and meant very little to traditionally minded Iranians to whom the clergy were making a lot more sense. In June 1963, after giving the aforementioned speech, the Shah had Ayatollah Khomeini arrested and then exiled, especially for speaking out not only against the land reforms, but also against women's emancipation. This led to riots, which the Shah ruthlessly suppressed. And with his regime increasingly engaging in censorship and resorting to authoritarian measures to put down dissent, he lost the support of both the educated middle class and the peasantry. Thus, he somehow managed to lose support of both the liberals and the conservatives. The land reforms were implemented by the government paying the old landlords for their land and instructing them to invest the money in industry. The land was then sold to peasants at 30% below the market value using 25-year loans at very low interest rates. 1.5 million peasants took advantage of the offer, around half of the total peasant population. So what was the upshot of all of this? Many of the families who acquired the farms struggled to make ends meet beyond subsistence level. In fact, life was arguably harder for many of them than it had been under the old quote-unquote feudal relations. Then, those landless peasants who were not able or willing to buy farms, as predicted by the clergy, migrated to the cities. The old aristocracy, as had been instructed, became industrialists, effectively recreating their old relationships with the landless peasants who had become their workers. The very socially conservative peasants resented the Western influences they saw in the cities, for example, women wearing short skirts, and particularly the bid to educate and emancipate women. In order to understand this, you have to put yourself in the mindset of an illiterate peasant who has been uprooted from his traditional way of life, thrust into the city, and then on top of that told to accept Western-style feminism and liberal values. With the greatest will in the world, how did anyone expect it to happen? These factors would contribute significantly to the Shah's eventual overthrow and the Islamic Revolution of 1979. The Shah, it seems to me, is a truly tragic figure. He had, in his own mind, the noblest intentions. I do not doubt that he wanted to help his people, but he will go down in history as the last Shah of Iran, breaking a line of kings going back to 678 BC. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and if you really like my content maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.